is Frank Islam, Chairman and CEO of FY Investment Group and your host of Washington Calling, where we interview leading voices from business and politics that impact you, the viewer. Today, we are fortunate to have a distinguished guest, Dr. Narayan Chado, who is a policymaker, economist, educationist, and best-selling author, and a member of our Indian Parliament. Thank you very much, Dr. Pado, for coming to our show. Welcome to our show, and thank you for your leadership. Thank you for all you do to make a difference. And thank you for serving India and the world. You have a very distinguished career, Dr. Jada. Please tell us briefly about your present public role for our global audience. Uh, presently, I'm a member of uh, the Indian Parliament, uh, and I'm a member of the upper house of the parliament. So uh, uh, in American parlance, uh, it would mean that I'm a senator uh, okay. in the Indian parliament. And I'm a nominated one. Uh, the president of India has the authority to nominate 12 people from different walks of life uh, into uh, the parliament. And I'm one of those. Um, appointed by the Honorable President of India. Very nice. And thank you for serving India. Uh, you are making a difference. I want to ask you a question. As you know, India is going through an election that has caught the attention of the world for its scope, right. for its size, for complexity. How does India manage mm -hmm. election after election in terms of the voter registration for 900 million eligible voters and electronic voting machines? And India's democracy shines as a beacon of light as the world that is increasing and becoming dark when, it's, when it comes to democracy. So it is a testament of India's democracy. And I want you to shed some light on the NRI participation as well. All right. Uh, I think uh, you have already explained uh, and uh, you have already explained and uh, uh, talked about the Indian democracy, I would only like to remind you and the audience that when India became independent at that time, a lot of people, a lot of experts had uh, expressed their concern about whether democracy will take roots. Uh, and in fact, it was predicted that in 50 years, uh, this country, which is divided into so many religions, castes, and uh, creeds, is going to not hold up and it will be balkanized it will be broken down into pieces and democracy cannot survive in a country like that it has been proven wrong and i'm very happy and proud to say that india in india democracy has taken roots and look at the countries around india you will find what i mean and in india you know uh, the elections which take place normally if, after every five years they are modern miracle and in fact 900 million people going to polls in very difficult terrain and without shedding any blood there is a change of power this is a great success of democracy in our country and i think that india does not get enough credit for this massive uh, yeah. endeavor uh, of the uh, demonstration of uh, democracy uh, at functioning democracy that it happens that happens around the time of the uh, general elections so i'm your advocate i'm writing a column in those time time that we publish next week about india's election i've also mm -hmm. written i'm going i just sent a column to tarun that will be published in every newspaper in india is about okay. india being a global beacon of hope for democracy around mm -hmm. the globe and it right. is a it is a uh, it is a testament uh, that the India's democracy is flourishing. It creates a common cause for all of us to be together. And India has a responsibility to become a global mm -hmm. beacon for democracy. And that's the point that I'm making in my yeah. uh, and 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 compared to what we have in the United States. In some cases, in the United States and some of the states, we are suppressing the vote, which is a, which is not consistent with the values, character, and conscience of a nation that is the oldest democracy in the world. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, shedding some bright light on India's economy. I know you're an economist, 
what reforms right. can be expected from a new government to create job, build prosperity, and creating a conditions and culture that allows people to prosper, to become an entrepreneur, to become innovator, and especially unleashing the potential of the younger generation who's under 30. Yeah. Uh, presently, India is uh, one of the, the fastest growing country in the world. Uh, but that's not saying much. We are growing at the rate of uh, roughly 7% uh, per year in real terms. Uh, and growth, while it is higher than uh, any large economic growth, um, it still falls a little bit short of India's potential growth, which is 8% per year. And if we want to raise standard of living of average India uh, to a decent level, I think we need to grow at the rate of 8% per year for 20 years at stretch. That is going to be the challenge for the government that takes over. And uh, it is very important important at this stage to note that India is going through the fortuitous advantage of what is called demographic dividend. India has large and growing young population and this is a great strength but this demographic dividend can become a demographic nightmare if we do not create enough jobs for people, if we do not invest enough in education, if we do not invest enough in health, the demographic dividend can become a nightmare and because we will be creating more mouths to feed, but not more hands to work. So exploring and uh, harnessing this forest demographic dividend is the biggest challenge that the government, ensuing government will have in the near future. Um, India uh, has to also uh, worry about the climate change. That is the biggest challenge right. India faces right now. And as you can see, when I went to India, you couldn't, the air is very toxic. You cannot even breathe the air. That's affecting the GDP, that's affecting the economy, and that, that's also affecting the health of the people. I want to change the conversation, yeah. Dr. Chado. You are educationist. You are the vice chancellor of a very distinguished right. university, and thank you for serving uh, that university. And country by the way pardon what do you say the largest sir? university, with the the largest university. Seven, oh my like, goodness hundred and fifty thousand oh my gosh it's a it's a it's a definitely one of the largest university in india uh, right. i am uh, i went to i went to aligarh muslim university i cannot hear you sir okay uh, no i was saying it one of the largest, it is the largest university in India. Oh, the largest. Thank you very much for correcting yeah. it. So uh, what reform is needed to improve the quality of education so the graduate can get jobs and you shed some light on that and have the skill to be the parts of the 21st century workforce. As you know, India has the third largest education institution in the world, but it is not matched by quality. Yeah. And a lot of people, a lot of students are leaving India to go to other part of the world. So tell me what what is what is needed to, to make sure that the that the quality of education is improved and they have the public and private partnership and so that we can create so that we can create more job and employment in India. Right. So this is exactly what uh, the demographic dividend is all about. Although we have the third largest education system in the world, uh, as you very rightly said, there is a lot of scope for improving the quality of education at all levels. And uh, that's a real challenge. And uh, I'm not worried about uh, some Indians going abroad, uh, particularly to United States and other countries for higher education, uh, because there are enough people in the country. Uh, but we have while there has been some improvement um, we have really a long way to go we really need a major overhaul of the education system in fact uh, one of the uh, the education policy of the national education policy is expected to be announced shortly after the new government takes over the, it has been finalized and it means a complete overhaul of the education system in our country 
Well, but also that the, it's not part of the conversation, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, for the election. And, and India needs to make a lot of investment in the education to create jobs and build prosperity so that, the, so that we can improve the quality of education. And also, a lot of education institution is owned by the politician, which also creates a conflict of interest. Would you agree with me? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, I do. In fact, uh, uh, you know, in India, although all politicians, pol all political parties have been making tall claims about education, fact of the matter is that India, whether it is at the central government level or at the state, that is provincial level, we have never made enough investment in education. In nine, way back in 1966, a very important commission was appointed called Kothari Commission, and they suggested that the public expenditure should be 6% of our GDP. Uh, I regret to say that in spite of uh, 60 years passing, more than 60 years going uh, passing, we are still less than 4% of our GDP. So Absolutely right. Massive no doubt about it. But investment is one thing. At the same time, we need specific steps to improve the quality of education, improve the ability of who are having education. Uh, we had a little bit of trouble in, uh, in your, uh, uh, because I think there is a connection problem. But I want to talk to you about, you are an author of nearly 30 books. As I understand, including uh, several books you wrote on no, Mr. Ambedkar. How many? 37. Of fact. 37. Thank you very much for your correction. <laughs> and and you wrote a book on the Mr. Ambedkar, author of the India's Constitution, father of India's Constitution. What do you think are the legacies of Mr. Ambedkar that can inspire the next generation? As you know, he proved that, that the, there's no monopoly in wisdom. Wisdom belongs to all. He also inspired us for political and social justice. Right. Is that the legacy that he left behind right. for all of us to be inspired by Indeed. him? In fact, I feel that uh, while Mahatma Gandhi is the father of nation, it is Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar who is the father of India's republic. He is the one oh. who awakened India's social conscience. Coming from extremely adverse background, he was born in an untouchable family and he rose to the position of writing the constitution, writing the constitution of our country. Uh, in the constitution and generally in his vision, uh, this is the message, this is the legacy that he has. He said that if you want to maintain democracy, not merely in form, but in substance, then three conditions are required. First condition is that uh, you have to hold on to constitutional methods of addressing all problems. All non-constitutional methods should be eschewed. This is one. Second principle, very important. He said that hero worship should not be there. And no matter what a great feeling you have about the leaders, never put your uh, democracy at their feet. And he said that uh, uh, bhakti, the hero worship, may be a path to salvation in terms of religion, but in democracy, it would certainly lead to a dictatorship. And the Very third well. one, the most important, third and most important message uh, of Dr. Ambedkar is this that what we have achieved, he said, at the moment of passing when the Constituent Assembly was approving the Constitution on 25th November 1949, he said that what we have got is political democracy. And this political democracy must be converted into a social and economic democracy. Very well for said. Sustainable if you keep it only to political democracy, it cannot sustain itself. In fact, I am tempted to give his uh, full quote, but I do not know whether we have time. Uh, uh, he said that on January 26, 1950, 
we are going to enter into a life of contradictions. Uh, in politics, we will have equality, and in social and economic life, we will have increasingly inequality. In politics, we'll be recognizing the principle of one man, one vote, and one vote, one value. In our social and economic life, we shall, by reason of our social and economic structure, continue to deny the principle of one man, one value. How long, he said, how long can we continue to live with this contradiction? He said that we must remove this contradiction at the earliest. Those who suffer from inequality will blow up the structure of political democracy, which this constituent assembly had so laboriously been I think that is the essence of legacy of Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar. A very well articulated, very, very eloquent expression. I, as I understand, you went to the school of the United States in Indiana, and I live in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so yeah. what are your thoughts on the current states of the India-U.S. relationship and the contributions of India diaspora in this relationship and how can India achieve its fullest potential? Do you think the U.S.-India relationship on its study trajectory and and uh, as you know, we have a shared interest and shared values, the United States and India. Democracy and diversity are yeah. the two things that binds us together as an American and as an Indian. So, sure, and as President Obama said, and I went with President Obama to India, he says it will be a defining moment of this century. So do you think the relationship is still being defined? <laughs> well, well, we uh, the Indo-US relationship has gone through many ups and downs, but I think it is now very steady Basically, uh, United States is the largest democracy, whereas India is the most populous democracy. We share the same set of values, and therefore, we must have very strong relationship between countries. So these two ties, the ties between the two, need to be strengthened. Now, what can Indian diaspora, uh, what role can they play in strengthening these, uh, these, this uh, tie-up? between India and United States, several things. You know, lots of things are happening already, but in the field of research and development, in the field of uh, higher education, in the field of entrepreneurial development, uh, and of course, in the field of politics, there is a lot of ties has to, has to happen. And today, today, uh, there are lots of, uh, you know, days of transnational, uh, migration, there are first generation American who are having one foot in America and other foot in, 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 in India. And I think this needs to be encouraged more in terms of the startups, in terms of uh, NGOs, and in terms of think tanks, collaborative research. Um, also, are among the companies and the business ties, you know, the Indian diaspora can play a major role in strengthening the ties, including by their effective participation in low politics in the United States. Very well said. So the Indian diaspora has the capability, the capacity, and the responsibility to help India achieve its fullest potential, not only in healthcare or climate, also providing seed money, right. innovations, entrepreneurship, creating a job, and also in education. Right. I think you said it very well. And I hope you can you can come to the United States uh, to tell our India diaspora uh, what what they need to do. And they're very strong and they're vibrant, they're resilient. They do a good job, and I'm very proud of them. I am one of the Indian diaspora who take a lot of pride in our heritage. So I thank you very much uh, for the time being. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jadhav, and. Uh, Thank you very much for watching the show. This is Frank Islam wishing you a great week.